Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on red-legged earth mites, which is brought to you by Local Land Services Central West and Central Tablelands in collaboration. This project is supported through funding through the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. I'm Ryan Leach, the Mixed Farming Advisor with Central West Local Land Services, and together with my colleague Liz Davis from Central Tablelands LLS, We've invited the experts from Caesar Australia to present on red-legged earth mites and their significant impact on agriculture in the southeast of Australia. This is the final in a series of webinars Caesar has presented on behalf of LLS. So if you've missed those others, links to the recordings will be available in a follow-up email that we'll send to you. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd like to welcome Dr. Lizzie Lowe and Dr. Lewis Mata from Caesar Australia as today's presenters. Lizzie is a senior extension scientist with Caesar and is based in Sydney with sustainable insect management and biodiversity conservation, the core focus of her research. Lewis is an eco uh, ecologist and entomologist with an interest in sustainable agriculture, citizen science and science communication. He's the lead research scientist at Caesar Australia, where he works alongside Caesar's high performance team to lead research activities focusing on sustainable farming practices, invertebrate pest management and biodiversity conservation in agro ecosystems. I'll now hand over to Lizzie to begin today's webinar. Thanks, Lizzie. Great, thank you very much, Rowan. Um, so for those of you who came here a bit early, we had this poll that I've started up. I'll just give you a quick summary of uh, what's going on there. I'll end that poll so that, and share the results with you. Um, so about 60% of people have encountered red-legged earth mite before, um, um, but lots of you haven't heard of the insecticide resistance management strategy. So we've probably got some useful information for you here today. Now, one of the very first things when we're talking about mites is identification. And I'll get into why that's so important in a second. But when we're thinking very, very generally, um, I want you guys to think about just what is a mite? How do we tell the difference between a mite and an insect? Because they're all little critters, they're all, all over the place. And sometimes it's actually quite hard. So I am going to share another poll with you. This is the mite identification. So you'll see that all pop up on your screen. I want you to select which ones of those you think we can use as common features to identify all mites. So if we have some critters in front of us, how do we work out whether they're a mite or an insect and what are the features of mites that we've got on here? And you can just put them into that little poll. I'll give you one minute, half a minute. We've got some answers that are starting to come in. These are the questions here. Everybody so far is reasonably on track. Some people not a little, not, not so sure. Okay, I'll move through. So these are the common features of, I'm going to end that poll because otherwise you can see. Um, most people were kind of on board there. Uh, yeah, so all mites, if we're thinking about mites compared to insects, uh, mites are arachnids. Uh, they all have fused body parts, so basically just that one big body that you see. They don't have siphunculi, that's aphids. If you came to the aphid talk at the end of last year, you would know that. Um, they all have four pairs of legs rather than insects that have um, three. They don't have any antennae, although it may look like it sometimes if they're holding up those front two legs. And they all have this same life cycle. So they have eggs, larva, nymphs, and adults. So that's a very, very general overview of what mites are like. Now today we're going to be talking about these four different groups of pest mites and I'm going to tell you how to identify um, these four groups and how to compare them um, against each other. We've got the Balaustia mites, blue oat mites, Briobia mites and the red-legged earth mite. And the reason why it is so important to tell the difference between these mites is that they can have quite different responses to insecticides. So something Lewis is going to tell you about is the red-legged earth mite and the development of insecticide resistance. It's actually really important to know whether a mite is red-legged earth mite or not, because that means if you spray, it can actually make it worse if the resistance is present in your area. 
They also have different risks on different crops. So if you have a particular mite, it might not actually need spraying on the crop that you are growing. Um, and the, the, the management strategies will actually differ quite a bit as well. So time right is an example, which Lewis will talk about, which doesn't work on some mites and does work on others. So it's really, really important. But with recognising that is that it's very, very difficult to tell these mites apart sometimes. With these pictures we've got up here, it's kind of clear, but anyone who's encountered a mite will know that they are teeny, teeny, teeny tiny. Um, so we're not just going to be talking about the look of these mites today. We're going to have a bit of a talk about their behaviour, the kind of damage they cause and when they're around during the year to give you a couple of extra strategies to tell the difference between them. So if we go back to general mites again, just so you've got an idea of the different parts I'm talking about when we do the identification. They have these little chewing sucking mouth parts called chelicerae at the front. This is their non-fused, their, their fused body that doesn't have different segments. So even like a spider would have two segments here um, and an insect would have three. No antennae, they don't have wings. And as an adult, they have four pairs of legs. Confusingly, as, um, as nymphs, they actually have three pairs of legs but you generally won't be using nymphs for identification anyway because they're so small that you probably won't see them. So let's start with the red-legged earth mite, which is going to be the focus of um, the webinar today once we've done the identification. They are quite characteristic in that they do have these bright red-orange legs, but they, the, the real characteristic part of them is these big, very, very black velvety bodies, um, and that's a really important characteristic. The other thing is um, that they usually feed in groups. So you can actually find groups of up to 30 individuals. They're quite cuddled close together, whereas other mites will feed individually and you won't see them in those groups. And if you can't actually see the mites, but you're looking for what kind of evidence there might be from them, you can have a look at the damage symptoms. So the, the red-legged earth mite has um, this damage that it almost looks like frost damage. Uh, it's the silvering of the leaves in quite large patches especially if you've got larger infestations of the, of the earth mite. Now the red-legged earth mite um, life cycle is a little bit complicated. They have different types of eggs that are laid at different times of the year. The summer, over-summering eggs are laid at this period here before we get into the warm weather. The red-legged earth mite doesn't like the heat and so there's no adults present over summer. But what happens around October is that the females will build the eggs up within their body they crawl underground and they actually die underground with the eggs inside their body. And that's how the eggs over summer. So they avoid the warm temperatures and the dryness of summer by going underground. And then when we come around um, to this time of year, we're actually it's, it's the perfect time to be talking about red-legged earth mite now because they'll be hatching soon. This is when those over-summering eggs come out of their diapause and they hatch out around March, um, April, uh, depending on these climatic conditions. So. Um, they will only hatch after you've had five millimetres of rain, which is not going to be too much of a problem around most of the southeastern area this year, followed by temperatures below 19 degrees for 10 days. And we actually have a tool that Lewis will tell you about, which can, you can use to calculate whether those conditions have been met in your area. So once they've hatched out, this is kind of one of the prime times for them, which also corresponds with um, with seedlings and a lot of the crops that we're talking about, such as canola. So that's when a really important monitoring time is. But they will actually have multiple generations throughout the winter. So they connect three to four generations. So they're laying their winter eggs at this stage. The winter eggs hatch straight away and they continue on the, the different generations until that gets too warm for them again in summer and they go back to the diapause eggs. Now, the hardest two mites to tell apart are the red-legged earth mite and the blue oat mite, which is actually a, a series of three different species in southeastern Australia. And these species can be a little bit complicated. They do differ in their pesticide tolerance, which is important, but also their host plant preference. But on the face value of it, you can identify all three of them with these characteristics. Um, and it's actually almost impossible to tell the difference between these species just by looking at them, even with the experts. Um, so they're quite similar to the red-legged earth mite in that they have these big red legs. They also have similar feeding damage. They have that silvering uh, and they're a similar size. So that's where the difficulty is. The main difference is this patch that they have on the back of the body. So there's an oval patch here, which is kind of a, a, a reddy orangey color compared to the black body. Um, looks really, really obvious in this picture here. Um, as we'll show some pictures later, it's not always quite so obvious, but that's the thing you need to look out for for the blue oat mite. 
Unfortunately, for identification purposes, they also have a very similar life cycle to the red-legged earth mite. So they're active between April and November, just like the red-legged earth mite. They also lay winter and summer eggs. Um, so again, we're kind of looking at them at the same kind of time. But I'll just put this little point here that if you haven't heard of time right, then Lewis will tell you about it. But basically, it's really important that if you have a blue mite, oat mite problem, um, the time right is not going to be the solution for you. Time right only works for red-legged earth mite. Moving on to the Briobia mite. So again, this is a complex of a couple of different species. There's at least seven different species that we find in broad acre cropping in Australia. Um, they're less of a problem than the blue oat mite and the red-legged earth mite, but still important to be able to identify. They're quite a bit smaller um, and they've got quite a different body plan. So you can see the legs are much paler and they have these very, very long legs at the front. They're the ones that can kind of look like antennae when they're walking along. They've also got this kind of browny um, body and it's quite flat. I've, I've heard of people saying they look like little pies, which is kind of cute, party pie mites. Um, but there's quite a different shape to what the red-legged earth mites would be. They also have quite distinctive feeding damage. So you'll see that there's these long kind of trails that they make in the leaves rather than that broader silvering um, kind of pattern that we see with the red-legged earth mite. They also have a different life cycle in that they can be active throughout the year. So if you're seeing in mites in summer, they're more likely to be Briobia mites. Um, and they have eggs over winter. They do usually um, reduce in numbers over winter. They don't really like the very cold environments. Um, but again, you, you can see these mites at any time during the year. Uh, and the fourth one is the Belaustium mite. So these are much, much bigger than the other mites, up to two times bigger. Um, so that's one of the main ways that we can identify them. They look visually bigger than, than a red-legged -leg earth mite would. Um, and if you're able to get a closer look, they've actually got these cute little pad-like structures on the end of their feet. So they've got paddy little legs. Again, going to be pretty hard to see unless you've got a really good microscope. Um, and they've got quite different damage. So you can see an example here of um, the kind of curling action that they, that they have on, um, on canola cotyledons. Um, and they, they tend to have more of a, a wilting and a, um, a bleaching kind of effect on the, the leaves rather than uh, a spotting or a lined effect. And they do have these really short hairs that cover the body as well. And if we're looking at their um, life cycle, that's kind of similar to the first two mites we talked about. They, ha they can have multiple generations per season. They don't need the really cold temperatures to hatch like the red-legged earth might do, but they do need rain. Um, so they, they generally don't see them over summer. However, in the winter, in the summertime when there is rain, they can actually persist throughout um, the, the summer in the wet years. So in years like this, we may actually be seeing more of them around in summer than you would in other years. So I just want to highlight here that they are very, very difficult to see. Um, but, and one of the tools you can use here that can really help is um, a hand lens. So basically being able to put this little lens onto your mobile phone, they're very, very small, they're very easy to use. Um, Liz, is, Liz is showing you on here, which is fantastic. And I'm pretty sure Liz actually has some that she can send out to participants of the webinar. Um, that information will be in an email that comes out to you after the presentation. Um, but basically it means you go from having a look like this in a, like a just a general pan that's from, from a bit of um, plant beating there to actually being able to see a close up at least to get the color of the legs and the color of the body. Um, I would say it's basically an essential tool in order to be able to identify um, a red-legged earth mite or, or the other types of mites. So I'm going to get some audience participation again. You don't have to talk to us, but you do have to fill in this little pop quiz that I'm gonna send out. Uh, this is the next poll. So I'll stop sharing this one and bring the next one up. So this is question one. And what I want you to select with this first question is what features can we use to tell the difference between these two species? And if you can write in the chat, if you know which two species they are, that I hopefully that you've got some kind of indicators of what they might be, um, then write that in the chat. But just for this first question in the poll, what would you use if you looked at those two mites to tell the difference between them, if you had a nice clear photo like this?
Can everybody see that poll? And maybe everybody's just thinking about it. They're holding back a little bit. I haven't got any, any answers yet. This is definitely this is a tricky one, Liz. Yeah, I know I'm testing you. I'm not just gonna stand up here and teach. I, I want people to listen. So have a look at these two mites here. Uh, things like the shape of the body, the shape of their legs, whether the body is flat or not, whether it's round. Okay, I've got a couple of answers coming in. Short legs with pads, that's this one here. So that's a pretty clear one, at least from these pictures that we can use. Do we know whether the types of damage might be different for these two, or whether the life cycles might be? I've included this in here because it's actually, a, a, you know, it's a reasonable thing to expect that somebody might encounter. If you went out into the field, there are often selections of different mites in the field at the same time. You might end up with a pan with three different species. And so this is the kind of conundrum you might actually be faced with if you're out in the field. Oh, I'm having people put answers in across the three different sections. So there's just one first question there, and that's for this one. We've got two other ones that are coming up, but I'll, I'll move on from this one here. So I'm not sure if anybody wrote in the chat, but we've got basically we've got a Barobria mite and a Belaustium mite here. There are quite a few differences between these two. This one has the long, pale front legs. It's got a flat body. It's around all year, and it uses that trail feeding damage. This one is a blastium mite, much, much bigger, so probably two to three times bigger than this one, although you can't see that in the picture. Uh, it's got these short legs with the little pads. It's not around in summer, and it has different feeding damage. So I'll move on to the next one. These two here. So that you can actually move on to the next question of the poll, which I think some people might have accidentally used for the first one, but that's all good. I'll just give you a quick minute to have a look about what kind of features we might be looking at. And you might remember that these two are a little bit tricky because there's a lot of similarities. There's lots of things that we can't use to tell the difference between them. And that means we have to think about what we can use. So some of you might have picked that this is the red-legged earth mite on the left here and the blue oat mite. So the things that we can use are the velvety black body and that little patch on the back of the blue oat mite. And also one of the easier things to do is going to be looking at how many there are and how they're feeding. So if they're feeding in groups, you're more likely to have red-legged earth mite. If they're alone or in small groups, you're looking at blue oat mite. The problems, of course, are they're around at a similar time of year and they inflict similar damage. And the last one here, which may be a bit of a tricky one because this is one of these I haven't introduced to you yet, but some of you might know what it is. If you do know what the second mite is, and you can share it in the chat with us. And have a think about what kind of characteristics we might use. Okay, so this is the red-legged earth mite. And this is a snout mite. Um, so it does look quite different on the surface. Um, it's got a red body as well as red legs. It's got this long, funny little snout. And the feeding damage will be significantly different because rather than actually feeding on the plants, these are predators and they're actually beneficial mites. So these are the ones that you don't want to be controlling. Um, it's another complication with mites is that we've got a lot of pest mites, but there are also some really beneficial mites which can be used to control a range of different pest species. So next time you have a mite in the field, don't just assume that it's going to be a bad one and that you need to spray it because there's quite a lot of variation out there. Uh, and Caesar Australia, of course, are always here to help you with identification. So if you have um, some samples that you want to send in to us, you can send them into our pest facts and I'll put the information into the chat for you um, or just give us a call and we can talk you through it. So that's um, the identification section from me. I'm going to stop sharing now and hand it over to Lewis to tell you a bit more about management. You're on mute, Lewis.
All right. Sorry, I was muted before. I was just thanking Lissy for the brilliant talk and for our hosts today. And for, for you, everyone, thank you and welcome again. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you a little bit about noble options for managing red-legged earth mites. So this next bit of the talk is going to be totally focused on the red-legged earth mite. And hopefully by now, you know completely how to identify it in the field, which is we're going to reiterate a really key component of this is the species identification. Uh, so uh, just a little bit of context. Um, some of you might be aware, but if not, it's, it's really good to know that this research and extension that we're presenting today is part of a, a fairly large project uh, funded by the GRDC uh, with some really uh, great partners like the Department of Primary Industries in Western Australia, the University of Melbourne, and now with some co-investment from AgriFutures and MLA. So you can see that the relevance of, of this pest is uh, it's quite important and it's really good that we have this funding to, to conduct and to share with you today. And just to get you a sense, if I had to distill kind of like the objective of this, of this investment in one sentence and share it with you, it will be this. It's this idea that through everything that we're sharing with you today and still the research and extension that we're going to do across the next two years, um, we're aiming and we're hoping to be able to reduce the impact of red-legged earth mites by 10% by 2025. So when I say we, I mean all of us, right? Like it's, it's up to everyone. It's like how we engage with this extension that we're learning today, how we translate it into a good practice, how we do quality research and communicate it. And hopefully then we can all be contributing to, to this kind of like very big overarching objective of reducing the impact for the benefit of everyone. So let's start this story, uh, and like Lizzie mentioned, talking about insecticide resistance. And we'll start this story in the West, in the West of Australia, as the title of, of the publication here in the slide implies, um, in 2016. So as you can see in the map, uh, it gives you a sense of where resistance was present back in 2016. And so two years later, uh, my colleagues here at CSER and others published this work showing what was known about insecticide resistance for this mite back then. As you can see, uh, we have resistance to two very important uh, chemicals and they're concentrated at that moment, they were totally concentrating in Western Australia. And so as you can see, the species is also present in South Australia, Victoria, Tassie and New South Wales. But at that time, resistance was only present in the West. Now, fast forward to 2019, uh, although we reported this, and again, uh, through my colleagues here at CSER, we reported this last year, uh, but this is the story of three years after. And so only three years after, we can see here that at least for pyrethroids, um, resistance has moved into South Australia. And, and so this is very critical, right? Like we see that it can move really fast. And if you're wondering uh, how is this species being able to disperse, so there's different factors, and I'll just, I'll just share two. One of them, and it's very likely that the diopausing eggs that we mentioned before are being blown by the wind. Uh, and that's very, a very easy phenomenon to happen. But alternatively, we could also have independent evolution of resistance, which is essentially even more fundamentally more critical uh, in the sense that uh, it, could, it is important to keep track of, of this resistance because it could evolve again and again uh, if we don't manage it carefully. So this is just for uh, synthetic pyrotroids, and this is how it looks for uh, OPs, right? And so we see that we have this movement into South Australia as well, but look here how we, through the surveillance and monitoring, uh, we found at least one population of resistant mites in Victoria. And so this was, again, reported from 2019, we can only expect and predict that resistance is going to continue to spread uh, if we don't act timely. And that's why we want to focus the talk on, on management, right? So I want to, I want to ask you uh, this question here, just to, just to think about it for a second. And you know, I'll be super excited if you want to share this with me within the chat. But really, I just want you to, to think about it for a moment. And you know, some of you manifested that you had been exposed to the red-legged earth mite, um, but independently, do you believe that we should all be concerned about red-legged earth mites? All growers, independently of you're in Western Australia, 
if you're in Tassie, if you're in, a, in an area that's prone to a lot of rainfall or in a more dry area. Um, and I need to think about that for a second because the answer is that yes, absolutely. Uh, and we make this statement here and, and since 2018, you have had access to this management strategy uh, for the red-legged earth mite, both in grains and pastures. And this is basically kind of like the take home way message uh, for this is that you definitely absolutely want to be concerned about resistance. And so I invite you and, and Lisi is gonna pop in the, the link to this strategy in the chat so you can access it. It's a very kind of like a very interesting and easy to read document that provides a lot of, lot of good information. Some of it I'm gonna distill for you today. So in the guide, uh, there's three major key points that are made about how to go about thinking of managing insecticide resistance. The first point is we, you would be, want to be assessing the populations over successive checks. And as Lisi explained with the life cycle, um, this is all about trying to understand um, you want to make sure that you are detecting not only the right species, uh, but that you are detecting the mite before you engage in any management practice, right? And so, for example, um, that could mean that you could proactively, uh, instead of prophylactically, uh, identify when you want to do your management actions to contribute to resistance management. And then this is potentially a very key one that I hope makes uh, common sense, right? It's like the idea of trying to prevent to use the same mode of action over the multiple generations that we spoke about the mite. And so Lisi mentioned before that between the eggs hatching here in this period and potentially three to four generations before it goes into laying the egg, the summer eggs, um, you would want to not be using the same mode of action for control because that contributes to insecticide resistance. So for example, and, and we present some to tools to assist you in understanding whether potentially, if you already had done, say for example, a seed treatment here uh, with a neonic, then you don't need to spray an SR and OP at this stage. And that way you could prevent using the same mode of action repeatedly which is basically what contributes to the evolution of resistance. And then I put back here again, this, uh, you know, this idea of how critical it is to be able to understand whether you might have multiple pests at the same time because they will require different managements. And so obviously then this idea that you would try to reserve mixtures of chemicals only when you're absolutely positive that you have different pests. And that way we prevent uh, the evolution of resistance by providing a chemical to a pest that did not need it in the first place. So excellent, before I move forward, just to then uh, bring back the point that all these management advice is provided in, in the guide that is in the, in the chat. And then I definitely recommend that you go in there for more in depth uh, to build that kind of resilience and in-depth knowledge of insecticide resistance for the mite. And so now I would like to move into uh, some of the decision aid tools that, that are part of this project that we would love to share with you. These tools can really help you think about management. And a little bit of background here in this, in this graph. So bear with me, I'm gonna try to, to distill it. Uh, basically, we wanna be looking at things that are in green, uh, refer to practice management, so things that you can do. And the things in orange are things that just happen as the natural, uh, as, as would, would happen, um, given the processes that, that take place within the life cycle of the mite. So um, for example, just to cite a few examples here, uh, we know that it's very critical to think about what's happening in the current year and the next year, given that the eggs are dormant and they require these very specific climatic conditions to emerge. And so we think ahead of what needs to happen, right? So that's why we have what's happening in spring is gonna determine very strongly what happens next year. And that's why it would be very critical to time 
hence the name of the tool, Time Right, to, uh, to time what you spray in spring to prevent the buildup of the population that goes into the next year. Um, in the same token, you have things like uh, seed treatments. So can you think carefully about what kind of seeds you need to buy, what kind of treatments you need to provide for your seeds to assist with that strong, potentially strong hatching that you will have next year. Um, and then just a final example here, the, uh, the idea that how do you make the decision or how can you best make the decision of whether you will have to apply some, some kind of action at the moment of emergence, uh, if that's gonna be a, say if you decide that that needs to be a foliar spray, then how can you monitor to be sure that you actually require that, uh, that, ha that has not been already been taken at control by the treatment. Uh, and that's why we're gonna be discussing this hatching tool that can help you inform whether you need to apply this foliar spray. So let's go into the hatching timing tool. I'm going back to the life cycle. Uh, it's a very critical to understand this life cycles for these species. Um, because precisely we want to make sure that you identify that you're at this moment, a very, very critical moment for this pest, the transition between sleeping dormant eggs, right? Uh, that might be just completely new. They might have been blown by the wind from a different locality. So you could have probably never had red-legged earth moth problems before, but it turns out that this year you're going to have time because you have sleeping eggs in your paddock. And so if you're monitoring carefully, you would be able to find exactly, I guess that's the thinking, right? You would want to find exactly when are these eggs likely to hatch and start causing problems. And so uh, I believe Lucy has already popped up this link in the chat. Thanks, Lucy. And that way, you know, I recommend follow this link even just now while I speak to you and, and you can see how easily you can access the tool and you can start playing with it. I'll definitely recommend it because it's exactly what I'm gonna do in the next few slides. It's gonna, I'm gonna play here, not live, but with the slides uh, to show you what the timing tool looks like. Okay, so this is what it would look. And I hope some of you are already there. I truly hope that some of you are curious and just going to the side and having to play with it. That's all it's about. Uh, just by practice, we learn how to do these things. So the first thing the tool is gonna to ask you is to provide a location. So you can provide that location as accurately as you want by zooming in and you can find your paddock, find your locality. Um, and that's all you need to do. That's the first step is to find your location in the map. And then uh, the research that sits behind this, years and years of research that sit behind this, uh, as you say, you know, standing in the shoulders of giants, the tool goes back and looks at all the research that's previously done, uh, has some very interesting ecological modeling, about the, you know, the right temperatures and the right rainfall to be able to produce these assessments of temperature. So in red, you have max temperature and min temperature and the bars are rainfall. So they just happen to go against the same axis here. And that way we can know uh, whether those conditions have been met. And as I say here in my example, it says clearly given the conditions, right? Hatching has not been met for this year. So it's a good sign. If you put your location, it's gonna tell you where it's very likely you don't have red legged earth hatchings at this time. But I think another really interesting output from this, from this hatching tool um, is that it gives you the probability across 25 years. And so as you can say, you know, as game of chance goes, if your understanding of probabilities and odds, it's, it kind of becomes common sense that uh, you, the probability increases as the season progresses. And so it's really interesting that you kind of get a, get a sense of where you're at, right? Given a given date um, up to when it's 100% chance, if you had red-legged, they would have emerged by now. And obviously that's gonna vary with rainfall and temperature. And our colleagues, uh, our colleague, James Miner, who is um, ultimately uh, leading and has been responsible for producing the tool has shared with Lisi and I uh, this map, which is basically if you had selected the whole of Australia, the whole of our country as the locality. And then it produces basically this map where you can get sort of an average sense across all the data, across all the studies to give you kind of like a big picture of where and when will be the mites hatching. And so as you can see, I hope it makes sense by now, uh, areas that are colder 
um, and water will have early hatchings, right? Like say here in the south of Tasmania, and then in the opposite, so going across the scale, um, the gradient, you have areas that are hot and dry and mites will take much longer in the season and everything in between, right? So it kind of gives you a really good picture of this idea that how critical it is to start understanding how rain and temperature might affect this hatching and how this tool can assist you in just making that, that thinking easier for you, hopefully. And then finally, well, the other one was this previous slide is very general. It's kind of like averaging across, across years. Um, this one is a very kind of like recent, uh, very localized in time idea of when things might have hatched. So where, sorry, so like given the state, uh, the tool predicts that these areas that you're seeing here are likely to have already have red-legged earth mite hatching. So maybe that some of this concerns you and you can get a sense of, oh, it's likely that I might have already this pest in my, in my paddock. Excellent, so that was for the hatching tool. So we were down here, just to recap a little bit, we were down here. And if you do have then emergence, then you can, that's why you have to think carefully of monitoring and making a decision. In this case, it might be to apply uh, a foliar spray if you are across, across your threshold, right? If you're not, then there's no need to apply this. You might have detected it in time, monitor it in time, and come to the decision that you don't or you do need to do a, a conservation, um, sorry, a, a management practice. So now let's go, let's move into uh, time right, right? So going back here, let's have a look of a little bit down this, this kind of diagram. Uh, the previous year, right? You're thinking about how much, what's the abundance of mites in your paddock if you're monitoring and surveilling for that. Um, and that will give you a good sense of when is the right time, say to spray or to do any other management action to prevent buildup of population for the next year. And this is where time right then comes. And most of you will be probably familiar already by this. It's a tool that has existed for quite a bit. And the reason we bring it back here is to kind of remind everyone that this is a very important tool. It sits within this scheme that I'm showing you about different things that you can do at different moments of the life cycle. In this case, it's this idea that you would do this uh, just before uh, the, the summer period begins. And just to also highlight that we're currently working towards improving this tool. And so, um, and then adding some more of that complexity of temperature and local rainfall that we show you before for the hatching tool. But those are things that are, are, are still to happen. So for those of you who are familiar with time right, uh, then this is how you access the tool uh, through the Australian Wool Innovation Limited website. And it's as simple as entering the coordinates of your paddock. And then, yeah, I hope that then Lizzie has added this. Uh, again, I invite you to go and, and plug in your coordinates and then it will give you immediately that kind of advice on timing. And, um, and that's again, very useful for everyone to know when it's the right time to do this action. Now we spoke about, I suppose, um, when, right? The when aspect of things, the time, the time component of things. Um, but there's also the aspect of in under which conditions, like should I be doing a specific management? So what, what kind of risk, right? Would need to happen um, for me to, for you to want to engage in a specific action. And so this is the idea of sort of, I'll put it right here, um, this seasonal risk tool. And it all goes back to, and again, this is uh, something that you can access for the GRDC website, um, but we'll also plug in the, to the chat, the direct link to the management guide. And so again, this, this whole idea is to find out when you can make key decisions across the seasons that are relevant for the red-legged earth mite and sort of being able to assess whether you are at risk or not. And so if you're familiar with this, with this tool, I won't go into the details here, but you can see that then it can decide, for example, uh, if, you, you know, if you need to use time right, 
if you potentially could apply IPM principles? Is it time for monitoring for thresholds? And in the guide, the format that they take is making you sort of weight different options, right? Given an assessment of, of the time of the year, so this year, current year, uh, different agronomic components, and then you will have these weightings that I'm showing here. And so you could do this manually, right? I'm sure some of you have done this in the past and you can assess your different weightings and it will come to a score. So luckily, hopefully you'll be in the, in the low uh, component. So it means you're a low risk, but unfortunately sometimes you might be in the, in the high risks. And so once you have an assessment of your seasonal risk, right? You can go into, I'm going to click one side here. You can go into uh, going into this, what actions then should I do? Okay. So before I go into the actions, I want to jump back into what we're doing and proposing different here is that we have developed this decision aid tool to help you navigate that table that is in the practice guide and make it really simple and easy and flexible for everyone to use. Um, to, uh, to kind of arrive at this risk score. So again, I invite you to, um, I invite everyone to go into the link provided and then immediately seconds after you access in this link, you could be playing with this tool, uh, a, a few drop down menus here, options. So you can talk about and input, say the, the type of crop that you had in your paddock, um, what kind of management have you observed or have been doing, and after you populate these very easily, then you immediately get uh, a risk. So I, I, before I save this slide for you, I practice with it. I inputted some, some values here and I got a high risk score. And then immediately the, the management tool provides you with the different actions that you might take given the period of the year. So again, this is just a way to, for us to find ways that are useful and simple and flexible for you to sort of distill the information that is already already present in the management guide. And so in, in the paper version, then uh, you will assess for a given time of the year. Once you know your score, for example, if you're low, the decision will be not to use time right. So the tool that I was showing you before, you don't need to spray. Maybe you're in that lucky position where you don't need to spray in summer meaning you're contributing to insect insecticide resistant monitoring, um, or if you're a high risk, you definitely need to consider applying time right, so you can do it at the right moment of the year, and, and other alternative uh, non-chemical options as well. So again, there will be information for each time of the year and for each type of crop, and it's a very, very good uh, tool, a combination of the guide plus the decision aid tool to help inform and manage your risk. And so again, I'll come back to, to this idea to finish uh, the talk about how we can all contribute to, um, to reduce the impact caused by the pest. And hopefully we'll all be contributing uh, toward this objective of reducing its impact by 2015 by 10%, which will be really, really great if we all could contribute to that. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Um, Lewis and I do have a bit of time now for questions. We've had a couple come through the chat already that I have spoken to. So one of the questions that was written earlier was um, from Jocelyn asking that they're seeing some typical damage from red-legged earth mite in the paddocks where they weren't where they were present last year, but the predicted hatch rate for their area isn't for another month. So is it likely to be red-legged earth mite um, or could it be something else? Um, it, it could be red-legged earth mite, but we would still predict that they wouldn't be hatching out unless you've had those really cold conditions in which they need. So it's 10 days of below 19 degrees average for those um, eggs to hatch. So that those time points have actually come from a long series of research looking at, at, at what conditions under which they'll hatch. So we would say that it's unlikely that it would be red-legged earth mite if those conditions haven't been met. But of course, um, just because the the um, climate information that's collected by the Bureau of Meteorology doesn't say you haven't met those conditions, doesn't mean that the localised conditions on your paddocks haven't met those conditions. So if you're in a valley or something and you do experience colder conditions, 
it's possible. So that the two um, likely outcomes here are that you have met the cold conditions and it is red-legged earth mite, or that it's blue earth mite who's got a very similar um, kind of uh, damage. And so this is when you've got to grab out your, um, your phone lens, see if you can take a photo of it. Or as I said in the chat, we, you can send a sample to us or send some pictures or some video to us and we'll do our best to do that identification as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting question as to whether the irrigation would have an effect there. The blue oak might, they don't need those cold conditions, they just need the water. So I, my gut feeling would be it would be them, but it, it's hard to know without, without getting to have a look at some of them. Anybody else has questions? You're very, very welcome to um, add them into the chat. I'll actually, I'll stop recording now as well so that you can speak freely. Lizzie, I've got a question. Um, we're seeing a lot of cultivation.